everyone, I'm Shivangi Mishra and today we have Senior Advocate Ms. Indra Jai Singh with us discussing the issues at stake at the Triple Talaq case and the recent judgment. Ms. Jai Singh has fought for over 40 years for the rights of women in India and she continues to do so and she represented the Centre for Secular Studies in the recent Triple Talaq case. Thank you Ms. Jai Singh for taking out time for this interview. Could you begin with telling us about the history of the Muslim women movement against the practice of Triple Talaq? It's very, very interesting, of course, because uh, way back in 1984, <clears throat> it was Shana Sheikh from Bombay who filed a petition very similar to the one that Saira Banu has filed today, where she challenged uh, every practice in uh, Muslim personal law, which is discriminatory, which included triple talaq, which included polygamy, which included nikah halala, which included everything. Now, Shana herself was a woman who was uh, thrown out by her husband. So, uh, again, she was uh, a flesh and blood petitioner. There was a lot of criticism against her, I recollect, and I was representing her, so I recollect that. Uh, people said she's been put up by the RSS, and uh, others pointed fingers to her lawyer somewhat similar to what happened recently with Saira Banu as well. But she braved all those criticisms and she continued. But uh, somewhere down the line, the judicial system had so many delays to it that she decided she wanted to just get on with her own life and she abandoned that petition. She didn't go ahead with it. Well, that's where it started and I think I need to benchmark certain very important developments in the history of this movement. We all know about Shah Banu and uh, we also know that Justice, the late Justice Chandrachut's decision in the Shah Banu case was again a landmark judgment because it attempted a separation between religion and state and it did that by saying that a Muslim divorced wife could also file an application under Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which was a secular law. And I have to say that if that judgment was allowed to stand the test of time, we probably wouldn't have had to wait this long for the present judgment. Sadly, uh, the then Congress government attempted to reverse this judgment and pass the Muslim Women's Protection of Rights on Divorce Act 1986. Now, this act said, for example, that Muslim women will get only a provision and maintenance for the Iddat period. But the wording was interesting. It said made and paid during the Iddat period. Now, the other woman who I represented was also a Muslim woman from Calicut. She was herself the daughter of a judge. And a very, you know, middle, upper middle class family. She was married. She had children who were like, you know, in medical college and things like that. So grown up children. And uh, she and her husband were settled in Dubai, but they were planning to relocate in Cochin. So they were building a house in Cochin, and the house was almost complete. And one day, when she went to that house to kind of examine whether the walls are properly done and the doors and windows are all set and getting ready to move in, she received a letter, not a letter, a note uh, a, a note written on the notepad of a five-star hotel. I think it was a Taj, if I'm not mistaken. In which her husband said, Talak, Talak, Talak. And she was standing right there in the middle of the house, examining the doors and windows when she received this. Very uh, aware woman, very um, uh, together. And uh, she came to me and she decided this was not something she was going to take lying down. And so she was the first woman ever to challenge the uh, Muslim Women's Protection of Rights on Divorce Act in Cochin. 
And it was an ordinary magistrate's court again that gave her a lump sum payment beyond the three uh, month in the period. In other words, he interpreted this law and he said that a reasonable and fair provision made and paid during the Iddat period doesn't mean it's confined to three months. This judgment was carried in appeal to the Kerala High Court, finally to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, it was Daniel Latifi, the late Daniel Latifi, a very, very prominent left wing lawyer uh, in the Supreme Court, who also challenged the constitutional validity of this law. Sadly, of course, he died before the judgment was delivered. But we were all there, we all argued the matter. And in a judgment which is reported as Daniel Latifi versus Union of India, the Supreme Court decided that the words reasonable and fair provision made and paid during the Iddat period meant that uh, they would get a provision for life, not confined to three years. So in a sense, my friend was vindicated, my client was vindicated. Now people have been arguing that this law is sufficient and it protects Muslim women, but we all know this is strictly speaking not true. The question still remained, why were they taken out of the framework of a secular law. So uh, these have been the milestones. There was Shanaz Sheikh, then there was Shabanu. So do you think this was the rationale behind the triple talaq? Like, was this the argument in the court? Like the rationale be be behind abolishing triple the practice of triple talaq? There has been a judgment of 1952 uh, delivered by very eminent judges, the late Justice Gajendra Gadkar the late Justice Jagla, which held that personal laws are not law within the meaning of Article 13, which means basically that they cannot be challenged on the ground that they violate fundamental rights. Now, it's really, really ironic that they gave this judgment because they wanted to uphold uh, the Hindu Bigamy Act, which abolished bigamous marriages for Hindus. And the argument was, why is it that you are abolishing bigamous marriages for Hindus but not for Muslims? So they invoked, a Hindu husband invoked Article 14, the right to equality. Now, in that process, and I think unknowingly, for wanting to achieve the right result, for wanting to say that this law was valid, they said that personal law is not law within the meaning of Article 13 and therefore cannot be challenged. But that judgment became like an albatross around the necks of all women, whether they are Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, it doesn't matter, because personal laws apply to all of them. So it's been a huge challenge. How do we overcome this? And this was an appropriate occasion. And I don't know if you remember, but many people remember that I said in court while arguing the triple talaq case, we need to exorcise the ghost of Narsu Appu from our jurisprudence. And then, of course, the next question is, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, Ms. Jai Singh, do you think we've exorcised the goats of Narutsu Appu? So what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Justice Nariman's judgment comes closest to exorcising the ghost of Narutsu Appu because he says that after the 1939 Act, the Sharia Law Application Act, Muslim personal law is codified and once it's codified law, it's law within the meaning of Article 372 and it's also capable of challenge by uh, through fundamental rights and indeed he and his brother judge struck it down on the ground that it violated Article 14, that is the right to equality, on the ground that it's manifestly arbitrary, quote unquote. Mm. He has been criticized for not striking it down under Article 15, that is discrimination based on sex. And I join hands with that criticism. He could have gone a step further and said that it ought to be struck down. So but overall, I, were you satisfied with the reasoning of the court or do you think that it... Well, I think the biggest breakthrough is that Justice Nariman allowed personal laws to be challenged on the ground of violation of fundamental rights and to that extent I'm very very pleased. There are arguments and arguments, 
uh, there is an argument that two other judges have said this cannot be done and therefore we really don't know what the law is but the fact of the matter is that triple talaq is gone yes so on the subject of reasoning do you think that the judgment has advanced the the cause of gender equality that is undoubted because all five judges have signed on to the statement which says triple talaq is abolished so there can be absolutely no doubt about the fact that it does advance the cause of gender justice and to that extent very welcome and will this judgment according to you open the doors for future litigators and to challenge the personal the discriminatory personal laws of the country the judgment of justice roington and justice yu yu lalit definitely opens those doors so whether it's hindu whether it's christian whether it is parsi whether it is muslim whether it's buddhist whether it's sikh it doesn't matter it can be challenged and almost all laws now are codified and with this declaration that muslim law personal law is also codified i think all laws are capable of challenge in fact geeta harrier and herself had challenged section 6 of the hindu minority and guardianship which is so blatantly discriminatory it says that uh, the father and after him the mother is the natural guardian obviously it's time to challenge that once more because the supreme court did not strike it down there were no women on the supreme court bench on the case what do you, how do you see that it's tragic one word okay. all right um also the current government is taking the credit for uh, for this victory for the victory of muslim women what do you all have right. to say about well that? let me tell you uh, the decision that we took that is center for secular studies and biba collective on the one hand and bhartiya mahila andolan on the other hand to go to court and present our case was not a very easy decision because we obviously didn't want to be identified completely with the stand of the government but we wanted the court to know that secular individuals of all persuasions hindu and muslim were there before the court to present their point of view which is why we intervened and i think it's a success story because we didn't want to abandon that judicial space that democratic space to just the government to a contest only between the government and the and the muslim personal law board which it would have been if secular individuals and secular muslim organizations had not approached the court so that's the first success story the women's groups have already issued a statement which is available publicly uh, in which they not only point to the um, very um, hypocrite hypocritical nature of the commitment to muslim women by pointing to what's happening with lynching of the minority community by pointing to the fact that there is little or no representation of muslims in several states ruled by the bjp and ultimately they say that the issue here is beyond religion and that the, the, they they recognize that the battle against misogyny and patriarchy has not ended it's a long journey ahead and they also point to the fact that if it's a victory it's not just a victory for muslim women it's also a victory for hindu women and women of all persuasions because of the entry of the constitution into the field of personal laws